So thank you, Barbara, for the lovely introduction. Um, my talk today is titled, It's Not the Apple, It's the Tree. Um, and in this talk, I'm thinking a little bit about typography and type systems and how those relate to systems in real life. So I've always loved type, and I think of a letter as the smallest element of a larger system. And like the letter, an apple represents an individual outcome of a greater system. And systems can create good or bad outcomes. Right now, we're living through a historic time uh, where a lot of talk is, uh, there's a lot of talk about systems being broken and about bad apples. I personally don't really believe in bad apples. I believe in bad systems design. In this, uh, this uh, article header from the New York Times showing some of the police brutality that's been leveled against uh, protesters um, around the country and in New York City, um, is very disturbing, obviously. And so people ask the question, is it a few bad apples or a few bad apples ruining the bushel? Um, in my opinion, there's a system that incentivizes and produces this kind of behavior. So as the saying goes, the system isn't broken, it's working exactly as designed. So what does this have to do with type design? Uh, we're designers and we design systems. So maybe we're not designing a police system, um, but we do work on other types of systems. So what kind of power do we have? Um, we also work within systems and we can either participate in the systems or seek change within them. And systems are everywhere. Uh, designing systems has led me to understand that they're the invisible structure that hold everything together. So similar to the grid on a page, um, even though you don't see it, it's what provides structure and creates outcomes. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit of my work, um, some smaller design systems that are more typographically based to some larger design systems. Um, that are more comprehensive, and then some thoughts on how all that uh, about how all that relates to systems in real life. The first project I'm going to talk about is called Color Theory, um, and this was a Black History Month campaign um, that was created uh, by Frog Design, um, and it was intended to elevate the voices of Black designers. Uh, so the social media. Uh, Manager Nicole Reed came up with a concept of um, basing the, the work, basing it on the work of artist Tomashi Jackson. Uh, Tomashi Jackson was a graduate student at Yale when she started digging into um, Joseph Albers' interaction of color. And she took it and compared it side by side um, with pieces of brown, brown versus uh, education and found that there were similar language in interaction of color as there was in uh, language around redlining. So we needed to come up with a social media campaign um, that promoted an event that would ultimately be held at Frog Design. Um, so we looked at contemporary black artists use of, use of color and um, graphic patterns. Um, and so what we did was we took quotes um, from black employees and set them in vibrating colors using Florian Karsten's screamer typeface. The intention here was to take uncomfortable fragments of people's uh, quotes um, and set them in a way that literally takes up space and the colors vibrate and they don't necessarily conform to restrained design principles. Um, the back slant and the forward slant of the typeface add some extra tension. So Nicole's piece was published on Frog's Medium site, uh, Frog Voices, um, and the graphics were used there in, in context. Um, for the event itself, uh, all of the graphics that had been used on social media were then used as environmental graphics. And this is the hallway where people walk into the event. And then the uh, it culminated in the salon. And the intention here was both to elevate the voices of black designers, um, allowing people to come together, share their experiences, um, and then open up uh, opportunities to the broader design community. Uh, the next project I'm gonna talk about is a little different, Barney's New York. This was about creating a system out of chaos. Um, a few years ago, uh, Sagmeister and Walsh commissioned uh, my business partner, Kevin Brainerd and I, to help collaborate with the Barney's creative team on a commemorative book, uh, looking at their last 100 years. <clears throat> um, so it was a 300, 300 page book. Uh, we need to pull together the last 100 years of ads, imagery, ephemera, recipes, articles, and essays. Um, it needed a strong but elegant design hook to pull it all together. So this solution was very typographic. Um, we basically chose Swiss typefaces Excel font um, to pull the diverse content together. Um, with a bold and its bold bold language kind of did that job. Um, one part of the project that was really fun, there were a number of recipes from their famous restaurant Fred's that we needed to illustrate. Uh, so we we hired a bunch of photographers to illustrate them and basically just said, here's the recipe, um, you know, do something kind of 
wacky. Um, so this, I believe, is Stephanie Gano's uh, take on potato latkes with salmon. Um, and we had short sheet recipes. Um, and on the back, I'll show you the artwork for those. This was another uh, recipe that um, Brian Kelly photographed, and this was asparagus with um, shaved Parmesan. This was Elise Mesner's take on another salad. I forget which one. And then, as I mentioned, on the back of each recipe, we had um, a blank a blank space. So we hired uh, Na Kim, who's a book designer and illustrator, to come up with some witty takes on uh, Barney's brand voice. So we feel like giving giving people a framework to work within and letting them do their best work is a recipe for success. Um, and then additionally, we had some sort of bad press photos, like hundreds of them that we had to run over several pages. Uh, so we hired um, artist Trey Wright to kind of take them to a new level through his collage work. So while we were working on that project, we proposed some uh, type uh, pages that uh, were rejected for the design of the book. Um, and so the following year, uh, we didn't have anything to enter into Type Directors Club. So um, my business partner, Kevin, had the great idea of having these, be, having these type uh, designs output um, onto beautiful uh, large scale uh, printed formats. Um, and then we entered them in the Type Directors Club and won an award for them. So um, just because something isn't selected for a final design doesn't mean you can't use it for for good purpose. Um, and in 2018, I worked on a campaign of Catalina Cruz. She was running for state assembly um, in my district of Jackson Heights in Queens. Um, so this is really a story about getting involved in a broken political system. Um, this, just for context, this was happening at the same time that Ocasio-Cortez was running in the same neighborhood, uh, obviously for the federal level. Um, but after the election of Trump, a lot of people in the city and a lot of people in my neighborhood um, looked around and realized that their local representation really wasn't uh, representing them. Um, a lot of them were lobbying with Republicans and essentially we had no representation. So in um, 2018, a lot of new grassroots candidates started to run for office, and I got involved in branding Catalina Cruz uh, for her uh, bid for state assembly. So the, the typographic system that we created for her um, highlights her first name as the word mark, uh, sort of reinforcing idea of her being a person that re represents you, and she's on a first name basis. Um, the system was created using GT America and Grotzek. And we created a patterns out of her word mark just to easily be able to create banners and posters and things like that. So the neighborhoods that she represented, Corona, Jackson Heights, and Elmhurst are among the most diverse in the world. And we really wanted the campaign to both reflect and include all the members, all her constituents and the diverse groups. Uh, her homepage design uh, uses use color blocking that became the main visual uh, theme of the website. And because she was a dreamer, uh, she was an she was a formerly undocumented uh, person. Um, she would she was the first to win elected state office, and so that we wove that into the messaging of her uh, of her site. So dare to dream, and you can see how that plays out a little bit. The graphic language. Uh, we spent a couple of days walking around with photographer Jason Falchuk documenting the neighborhood and we incorporated the imagery into the campaign materials. Um, and we were very inspired by sort of the, and, and embraced the chaos and vibrancy of the neighborhood, the eclectic typography, um, and just all the different people that were thriving there. Um, the color palette was based on cheap printer paper um, and, and post-it note colors. And we did this because we wanted people to be able to easily print out posters and slogans and, um, and make signs easily. And so you can see here some of the results of that. One of my favorite things was seeing uh, materials that uh, volunteers produce themselves. So you can see in the bottom left, the Catalina um, is hand stenciled. Um, and it fits in really nicely with the vernacular typography of the neighborhood. And this is just a loop of some of the social media posts of um, her, her volunteers and supporters creating their materials and making the campaign their own. It was cool to see uh, her highlighted and a little bit of a campaign on Sam Samantha Bee's show. And just a few months ago, Catalina sent me this. Um, this is, a, I forget which show it is, but somebody completely knocked off the campaign, um, including the sort of color printer paper and the center type, the simple typography. 
Uh, so Consumer Reports, this is a, a larger scale system, and this was really about creating storytelling systems and hierarchy for them. Um, what's, what was cool about working for them is that they're a really great organization and that they spend a ton of money and resources on testing out products and then actually advocate for consumers. Um, their work has led to many unsafe products like drop down cribs and car, unsafe car seats to be pulled off the market. So the magazine is what supports all of this work. Uh, when we came to the design, um, Pentagram had done the previous version and it had sort of devolved over time into sort of a chaotic, jumbled, uh, cluttered mess. Um, and so there was no there was no hierarchy. There wasn't really anything conceptual. The artwork was very literal. Um, and I'm pretty sure we only got this job because Pentagram didn't want it. Um, on the interior of the, um, of the magazine, um, again, kind of wall-to-wall -wall content imagery that's not particularly engaging um, and just really, really dense information with no hierarchy. So we started with the cover and our, um, our strategy here was to recommend one central focus, um, either a product or a concept um, that is very central with central typography that's bold and clear. Um, we created a system for their secondary cover lines along the top of each, um, of each cover. So they actually didn't lose any content. It's just much better organized. On the interior uh, for the section openers, um, we created um, not just throw away large openers of, that are imagery, um, but actual content. So using a data visualization on the left um, and using conceptual photography to convey information that might um, link out to a larger, larger story. Um, on the interior, uh, we um, created a new section along with the editor, Ellen Kempinski, called Your Advocate. Um, and this really highlights the advocacy work that the organization does. We've, we all felt it was strange that they weren't promoting that because it's something that resonates with people. Um, so again, it's jammed with information, but we've used typography to create hierarchy. And we've also used conceptual illustration to help tell stories in different ways. The um, two on the right are by Paul Serre and the image on the left is by Grant Cornett. And we even embrace those pages that are just jam packed with text, um, kind of like we enjoyed having that challenge of creating texture and hierarchy through typography in order to keep the page digestible. And sometimes it was about removing content. So rather than having a comprehensive chart of 300 cars, um, what, what are some ways to get people into the content by actually showing less information? We also introduced new storytelling uh, systems for them. So this was a long written piece on American shopping habits. Um, when we were thinking about how to, you know, how to art the story, uh, we proposed having uh, photographer Wayne Lawrence walk around the city and take people's portraits um, and a reporter would ask them for quotes around their shopping habits. So this humanized the story and allowed people a different way in. And additionally, again, more infographics, again, just different ways to, 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 uh, to visualize information and tell stories. Uh, earlier this year, I worked on the Frog website, so creating a new system for flexible storytelling. Um, these were the previous templates. Um, this was essentially a broken system as well. It wasn't performing for the company in terms of SEO, and it wasn't serving as a business tool. Um, the navigation was confusing. Um, the graphics were uh, sort of overtaking the work. Um, it was hard to uh, update the site in terms of creating new case studies or blog posts. Um, and we felt that the top typography had a little room for refinement. Um, here you see, Quint, uh, I think it's Quarto, Black, and Benton Sands. Um, so our first, our first, first thing that we did was radically simplify the navigation uh, to the, the key um, destinations of the site. So no more drop down menus, but it's a very simple navigation. Um, and then creating a really immersive uh, scrolling based storytelling that really elevates the work um, and, and minimizes um, the type, except when you want it to be large and, and show messaging. So like here on the blog, you can see the type is larger. Um, and then what you're seeing here is not a blog post, but a, a all the components that could go into one so that the editorial design team can create those posts easily using a system of modules. And so those are all the pieces and they can be used um, together or mu multiples of the same ones. Um, so really giving them flexibility in, in terms of their storytelling. And then also, of course, creating a typographic system that can be maintained going forward. Um, you can see here we've gone from the 
the Quarto Black um, to the Quarto Light, and we've gone from Benton to GT America. And finally, Hearst, um, here working on working with the Hearst product design team uh, to create a scalable design system that can power an infinite number of websites around the world, which is kind of an, an amazing thing to be able to work on. Um, so Hearst, Hearst powers um, you know, a lot of brands, and the goal is that it's an infinite number. So you can see here, we're looking at um, different ways to, to tell stories. So these are explorations around image galleries. Um, can they be scrollable? Can we, can we show related content that can either be monetized or is personalized? And then again, creating a spacing system that can be scaled across all those sites. You can see here, these, these are modules that appear across the site without any style. Um, and each of these blocks can be used repeatedly and there are styling uh, variations for each one. So you can see here the various brands using different styling with the same, the same skeleton. And then we're also recreating the CMS to reflect those same styling options. So again, the idea here is that any small or large publisher could use this tool to create whatever kind of storytelling experience that they want. And this is just an overview of how we're thinking of working across all platforms and services. So going back and forth between code and, and design, using shared component libraries that can go across sites, um, having a theme publisher that's easily updated and scalable. So looking forward, thinking about systems in real life. Um, so I'm a believer in systems and the power of them. I don't really believe in bad apples. I think good systems create good outcomes. And I think bad systems can create bad outcomes. So we aren't police, obviously, but we are designers and we design systems and we work within them. So we can either re, uh, reinforce or seek change within those systems. I believe we have power. Uh, we are direct photo, uh, photo shoots. We hire designers. We commission typographers and photographers, illustrators. Um, are those hires uh, reflective of our nation's diversity? Um, we hire, do we hire our friends and friends instead of intentionally opening up opportunities to new groups? Uh, we design products, so we're thinking about all types of users. We help shape, shape workspaces, and we may participate in clubs that are by their nature exclusionary. We tell stories and we shape culture. So how can we make our systems better by making them more inclusive? Um, I definitely don't have all the answers to that, but I think it's important that we all think about the systems that we participate in, uh, note big or how small. Or... And so for me, I've been thinking a lot about this tweet by Brittany Packett Cunningham. And so as I think about what systems I have influence on, um, I will think of it every, every time I'm part of a system I'm involved in and thinking about how I can make it better to produce better outcomes. Thank you.